I'm going to ask our genetic counselors here, Elizabeth and Colleen, to, if you want to pick up the handheld and just tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, so I'm Elizabeth McCormick. I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, mostly with Dr. Marnie Falk. And we see um, folks in our mitochondrial genetics diagnostic clinic. Um, and then I'm also a study coordinator for a couple of Dr. Falk's research studies. Um, so that's mostly me and what I do. And I'm Colleen Marescu. I'm also a genetic counselor at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I work with Elizabeth and Dr. Falk in seeing our clinical patients as well as helping in our research and hopefully soon some clinical trials as well within our department and kind of to expand it into the patient field as well. So the first question I have for you is in your experience, could you tell me what role does a genetic counselor play in the LHON journey? So in our clinic, we kind of, um, I guess, do the most work before you see the doctor and then after you see the doctor. Um, so what we do is we talk with anyone that's referred to Dr. Falk, get a full medical history, kind of get a good feel of what you've been through before you come to see Dr. Falk. And then um, during the actual visit, we just um, mostly help to explain the genetics behind it. Um, what it means for each person in the family, what it means for extended family members. Um, we help coordinate genetic testing. Um, we do our best to make sure insurance will cover everything. <laughs> it's not our favorite part of the job, but um, important for sure. Um, and then on kind of um, the, I guess, after the doctor's visit, a lot of times it falls to us to talk about test results. Um, you know, they come back positive, normal, what that means. And then again, just what it means for the person and the family moving forward. And are there any particular issues that you address with the patient and their family? Sure, so I think probably the biggest issue that comes up is the uncertainty issue. Um, the doctors before talked about the penetrance of the mutations, and as you all know, it just because you have one of the mutations doesn't mean you're definitely going to have features of it, and that's, I think, a big burden um, to have for family members. Um, so that's something we talk about, and then um, so uncertainty of, I guess, the prognosis of the condition, and then also the genetic testing certainly isn't perfect, and that's a lot of um, uncertainty too. So we just like to make sure everyone understands the limitations of the testing. Um, you know, a normal test doesn't mean what's going on isn't genetic. It doesn't mean it's anybody's fault. It just means science hasn't quite caught up to you. Um, and then I guess. And I'll just add a few, um, you know, as part of the journey is a lot of individuals don't have the resources. So where else can I find out how to get this testing? Who else should I be seeing? And also too, as part of their journey and talking with their families, kind of, you know, when to tell, how to tell their families. And in that part of the discussion, we kind of help them facilitate sort of, you know, relaying this complex information, taking it from what you've heard these experts say, this complex medical, and putting it into, you know, maybe your children that you're trying to tell who are maybe trying to plan a family or things like that. So we would also be part of that um, process with them, I think, you know, which is all complex. And do you have any particular tips or strategies on that? Because I think all of us, since LHON is such a simple genetic issue, but complex because we have maternal family members that we want to share the information, but it's a difficult piece of information, tips, strategies, ideas? So I would say that, you know, every individual is unique as well as we know every family is unique. So some families deal with, you know, tragic information and they send out a text where other families would say that's awful way to try to do it, but that's how that family communicates. So however in the past you've dealt with difficult information or tried to do that, go back to what you know and what your family is comfortable with. But, you know, also too, finding the right time, so, you know, for yourself even. So if you just received this diagnosis or are just receiving this information, going to your maternal relatives tomorrow may not be the best time. So making sure that you're comfortable first with the information before relaying it to other individuals, I think is a, a good strategy. We have also made family letters. So rather than, you know, of course, disclosing your clinical letter to your families, which might have other sensitive information, you don't want them to have, 
we have drafted family letters to help convey this information to your extended relatives, which they can then and go. You can email it, they can take it to their providers that are close by, find individuals, and that kind of helps the process. Um, another strategy is sometimes it's a lot for you to take on yourself. So maybe you have an unaffected sibling who would maybe be your champion in the family to help you to relay that information to other family members, which some individuals that seems to be a better coping mechanism, maybe they're the information the gatherers of the family that help disseminate all of that. So that has also helped some of the families as well. Um, and we've noticed, you know, in our clinic, some families come to us and it's just, it's like Colleen was saying, it's really hard information to share. You know, when you talk to your family members, usually, you know, sometimes you'll have a serious conversation, but you might have to tell them they're at a direct risk for something that could potentially be life-changing. Um, so what we try and do is when we see folks in our clinic, you know, we kind of work through, well, what would, do you think would be the best case scenario of their reaction? What would be, you know, your worst case scenario of the, of the family member's reaction if they were to be angry? You know, how would you feel? How do you think you could talk to them? Um, we've also actually had conversations um, in our clinic and on the phone where I'm the family member that the um, person in our clinic has to tell. And we'll actually go through it um, a, a couple times until that person that we see feels comfortable enough um, talking to their, their family members about it. Um, and the other thing that can be helpful, Colleen was saying, we've actually written letters for our families where, you know, we all have families. Sometimes you're not talking to certain family members. That doesn't mean, you know, you want them to be in the dark about this really important information for the family. So you could send them a letter and put, you know, our phone numbers on it. And then if they really wanted to know, they could call us. If they're not in the Philadelphia area, we can direct them to who in the country would be the best person for them. Um, so it's definitely a lot of information. It's a, you know, can be a burden to get the diagnosis and, you know, a burden to have to be the one um, to tell all the different family members that they could not have a chance of having this condition. So um, it's something we do see frequently and we think it's helpful. So That's great. One question that just came up in the last session, um, there was talk about the sort of the three-point mutation testing as compared with um, the whole mitochondrial. Could you explain the difference? Because I don't think everyone in the room knows. I suspect most of the families here might have done the, the three the, through Athena and would need a broader understanding of the options. So we try to think of genetic information if you're you know, looking at a paragraph in a book and you're spell checking it. So the three common mutations, you're finding three common misspellings within that paragraph. So that's what they're looking for. They're targeting those exact three locations and that they don't see the rest of the paragraph when they're looking at that. You're getting a yes or a no. So that's more black and white. With the mitochondrial testing, you're looking at the entire genome. So of the mitochondrial DNA. So just like you and I, we're all individuals. We all have variations, which you've seen as, you know, called before secondary mutations or other things. So they're actually spell checking that entire paragraph and looking for misspellings. And there's different ways to do that. And so that's why it's important to understand if you've had prior testing, taking it to someone who can sort of decrypt and say, okay, this was the technique that you've had testing on and has that changed? Is it worth testing again? Or, you know, have you already had the most updated testing and maybe you are in that five to 10%, we cannot, unfortunately, you know, identify a mutation. Um, yeah, so just elaborating on that a little bit more, there's definitely pros and cons to every test. Um, so the targeted mutation analysis that it seems like most people have, it's relatively cheap. And if your insurance doesn't cover it, sometimes it's something that you can afford out of pocket. Um, where, um, where we are and a couple other institutions, we actually have whole departments that verify insurance coverage for us. So if they come back to us and say, you know, whatever you send, insurance is going to cover 100%, we tend to like the more comprehensive where we sequence everything. Um, again, that's not without its um, drawbacks, because sometimes we find what we call variants of uncertain significance, and we don't know what to make of them. Um, but sometimes when we see someone with, um, you know, the common three-point mutation testing, and it's normal, you know, we kind of question, is it normal because 
the mutations aren't there, or are they at a low level of heteroplasmy that that test can't pick up? Um, so there's definitely pros and cons to the different methods out there, and we're always happy to you know work through that and work what's or help you work out what's best for your family in your particular um, that situation. Those were very helpful feedback points, and I'd like to again throw it open to questions in the audience. Um, Patty, way up front. And anyone else, put your hand up so we can get Cindy to the next question, if there is one. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if it's possible that a genetic test could come back saying that you have a mutation when, in fact, you don't have a mutation, just like a clinical or you know, some kind of error, something like that. Has that ever occurred? Um, so that, that can happen for a couple of different reasons. Um, so the clinical labs and the labs that send out the testing do everything they can to make sure that the sample that gets labeled with that person's name keeps that label to when they get to the lab. But there have been cases of sample mix-up where, you know, the test comes back positive at someone else's sample, not, not really your sample. Um, a lot of times before testing is able to be marketed, they have to show that they can detect positive mutations a certain amount of the time. Um, so there are guidelines that make the test as good as it can be. Um, and a lot of times a positive result, I'd say in the vast majority of cases, a positive result is a positive result. But we're always hesitant to say 100%, you know, yes means yes. I would assume that if you have all the symptoms of LHON and then it comes back positive, that's pretty much a guarantee. And yes, we would agree with that. And the other side point is, too, when you have clinical testing versus research testing. Um, so research testing, like Elizabeth was saying, does not go through the same validation as clinical testing because it's research. It's not supposed to be diagnostic. It's looking for something new or trying to validate it to bring it on to mainstream. So individuals who may have had testing in the past that don't carry one of the common three, they may have had testing and then gone to a clinical lab and not have had the mutation. We would value the clinical lab information over the research. Yeah, I, I did have a quick question. I was wondering why it is that some doctors you go to want to test the mother and the sister and then other doctors, like there's no need if you have mutation 11, 7, 7, 8, or any of the common three, you know, the whole family has it, the whole maternal side has it. So have, have you ever seen a case of someone having mutation 11, 7, 7, 8, where the, the, the affected person had it, but the mother and say the sister weren't carriers? Yeah, so that kind of um, goes back to the testing and what testing you have. So what's tricky about mitochondrial disease is it's not always, you know, yes or no. Sometimes it's maybe or kind of when it comes to heteroplasmy and homoplasmy. Um, what we can sometimes see is someone that's affected, their mutant load is 90-something percent. So 90 percent of their mitochondrial DNA has that change in it. Maybe when they go test the mother, her mutation load is like 5%. So whether you say that she has it or not, we say it's not quite so yes or, or no. Um, so we, if, what we usually tell our family members, if, you know, if it's something the mom's concerned about and she wants to know, then we can help her coordinate that testing. If she's comfortable enough with, a, you know, this is a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA, it's inherited from mom, um, if that's enough for her, then she might not want to pursue that additional, those additional studies. Anyone else? Yep. My daughter is one of the 10% who tested negative, and we have the option to go forward with the mitochondrial testing, but we haven't because we've been told that if any kind of mutation shows up, even if it has nothing to do with her eyesight loss, they would be obligated to tell us. So we ha I haven't been able to hear of a place who would not tell us, because maybe t sometimes too much information, you don't want to know all, all of that extra stuff. So is that the case where you work? So 
As far as the, so there's mitochondrial DNA sequencing and then there's nuclear DNA sequencing. Um, the mitochondrial DNA sequencing, we know more about it just because it's smaller than the nuclear DNA. So when we send mitochondrial DNA sequencing, you know, it's possible we find maybe she has one of the other mitochondrial diseases that isn't labor, it's MELAS or something like that. Um, a lot of times what we find are variants of uncertain significance, so it's a change in the genetic information and it's there, but we all have 20,000 of those changes in us and we don't have 20,000 different conditions that, that we have. Um, so for the mitochondrial DNA, it's more or less, we know more about the findings that we see. For the nuclear, so what we call whole exome sequencing, um, you would definitely, the labs do sometimes stumble across things that they weren't looking for. Um, the labs give families the options of what information they would want back relevant to their child or that person. And, and I think it's good that you're thinking about this, um, whether it's mitochondria, because any genetic testing may show you something that you weren't quite looking for. But on a clinical relevance, yes, if we receive a result, we are, you know, obligated um, to report back, especially if it has medical implications for yourself. As on a research basis, that's not the same kind of rules. Any last questions real quick before we move to our last panel? We've got one right up front here. So if I understand this right, his is heteroplasmic. If I test like at a 5%, does that mean I automatically pass it on to my daughter and my other son, or is it not as strong? So that's the tricky part of mitochondrial heteroplasmy because just like it is 5% in your blood, we don't know what it is in your eyes, or more importantly for your other children, what was it in your eggs or your ovaries? So it is harder to say in heteroplasmic families, we would strongly recommend other individuals to be tested if they want to know for themselves or for their own reoccurrence risk. Okay, great. Thank you. So we're going to um, thank our guests for their input.